so my mom uh, was a stay-at-home mom, quit her job to stay home with me and my sister. So I would say she was a very, um, you know, almost, I would say, worried and concerned. And I think I'm part helicopter, too. I'm never, you know, saying that I'm not. You can tell I'm a nervous person. Um, but nonetheless, she let me walk to school alone at age five because that was the social norm. And the guy who was the, the, the crossing guard was a 10-year-old because that was the norm. And today I was just talking to some people where we've tried to change the laws in a lot of different states, and we've had success in three states so far. Um, and we were talking to some lawmakers, or some policymakers in Virginia, and the law there says they don't specify exactly when you're allowed or not allowed to let your kid outside, which I'm glad about. But, but it said maybe some 10-year-olds are extremely mature and could be allowed to stay home alone for a little bit. And there are some 15-year-olds who couldn't. And I thought... I think there are some five-year-olds who are ready to stay home alone for 20 minutes. And to already put it at twice that age and to, to even undermine it by saying, maybe if you're super mature, if you're the best person on earth, maybe you could stay home alone and you know, watch a video for 20 minutes while you know, your mom goes and gets the, the rotisserie chicken. That's already um, just this new norm. And, and the thinking was that, that Kids could handle some things, and now the assumption is that kids can't handle anything, even being alone in their own home at age 8, 9, or 10. In, in Virginia, the actual law in some of the counties, or the actual policy, is that no child under age 9 is allowed to be home um, even in their own yard alone. Like, you can't be alone in the yard at age 9. That's, that's, a, that's a country that's gone crazy with safetyism. Well, and so this is actually a really interesting piece of this whole puzzle that there's it's not just one state or a few there's there's laws in many states that actually in a way force parents you know for fear for legitimate fear mm -hmm. of having social services come and take your kid if you do something that you might think if you're one of these rare parents that's actually wants to give that like, kids a little rare. more agency right right or if you're a parent who doesn't have a ton of money and you're working two jobs and you can't afford a babysitter and you know that your eight-year-old is going to be fine being home alone from 3.30 to 5.30 when you get off your second shift, that shouldn't be a crime either. It should be up to the parent to decide when their kid is ready. And so what we like is a law that says um, you're putting your, if you are neglectful if you are putting your child in obvious, likely, and um, serious danger. Right. And if you're not, I mean, yes, somebody could break into your house if your kid is eight. But if your kid's outside um, with you, they could get, you know, a drunk driver could hit them. I mean, you can't go by the least likely most horrible thing that could possibly happen. Say, having that be your um, whether that determines whether you've been safe or not, whether you've put the child in a safe circumstance. So we we passed laws in Utah, Texas and uh, Oklahoma. Uh, that are called reasonable childhood independence laws that basically say that, that uh, it's up to the parent to decide when their kid is ready for some independence. And unless they're putting them in actual danger, it's up to them. Um, the other laws, a lot of 47 states, it's not like all the laws are horrible, but they are open ended. And so parents are left not knowing. It's like a lot of the laws say, you must keep, give your child proper supervision until they are ready for not, you know, it's like, well, what are we saying here? Pro I think it's proper supervision to let my seven-year-old stay home with her eight-year-old sister. Uh, but if you don't, then I'm sunk. So we're trying to narrow the neglect laws so that they are more clear and, and also leave most of the decision in the parents' hands unless they are obviously doing a bad job, terrible job. You know, kids need to separate at some point, right? And where, and I guess the big question is, when is that? Yes, um, you've basically summed up everything that I uh, am thinking, which is that when you don't have a chance to prove yourself to your parents and to yourself that you are capable of taking care of some minor things along the way, uh, the definition of anxiety is thinking that there will be something that you can't, um, that, that's scary and horrible, and that you won't be able to deal. So you're afraid that something bad is going to happen, and you're afraid that you will be um, unable to, um, you know, what I say, deal with it. So 
we, we have a society that has sort of dedicated itself to making sure that children won't have to deal with anything scary or bad, or if, they, or if something comes up, there is already somebody there to help them through it. And so what, what they're not getting is the opportunity to face little problems along the way and get used to them and, and realize, oh, that wasn't so bad. If you don't realize anything isn't so bad, it's still so bad. That wasn't so bad means you thought it was going to be so bad, and yet now you have the proof that it wasn't. And once again, I have to go back to my favorite whipping boy, which is Parents Magazine. Um, had an article on play dates. Let's just talk about play dates for a second. Did you ever go on a play date? Well, I, I don't know if that was the term, but you know, we, we there would be like a slumber party. That would be definitely that's something a, parents would organize, right? or a birthday party. So party. those are those aren't play dates. No, play date is when two kids get together and play, and often there's two adults watching them. And here's why. So Parents Magazine, which I realize is a, an obsession of mine, had an article on um, on play dates, and it was the play date playbook. And one question uh, that a reader had asked was. Uh, my kid is ready to stay home alone, and sometimes she does, she's that age, but now she has a play date over, can I still leave and run an errand? And Parents Magazine said, whoa, absolutely not. Because, first of all, your child could get hurt, physically hurt, and they gave an example of some kid who once got burned by microwave macaroni, okay. Um, and then the second example was, and what if there's a spat? You want to be able to jump in before anyone's feelings get too hurt. So what's interesting to me about that is when we're talking about child or depression and anxiety is you're creating a, an extremely anxious child with the advice from Parents Magazine. If you're telling a kid that, oh no, you can't even handle an argument with your friend, a spat in the midst of you know playing Barbies or dress up, um, what you're telling them is that they have absolutely no inner strength whatsoever. And an argument is so damaging. Being upset or uncomfortable for a few minutes with your friend on a play date is so bad and, and final that you, you must avoid it at all costs. So it's driving the parent crazy because now they have to be listening. Are they having a spat? Having a, no, they seem to be kind of arguing or maybe they're just excited. I can't tell. And the other kid is having another play date and oh my God, what if I missed him having a spat? So you're, you're driving the parent crazy by telling them this is the level of attention they must be, be paying to all their child's interactions. Um, and then you're taking away the opportunity for a kid to get used to one of the many things that they're going to have in their life, which is an argument with a friend. And so you're telling them that they're fragile because they can't handle it, and you're keeping them fragile because they haven't handled it. You've been there instead.